Dr. Baguti was an award-winning peace activist. He's uh, fresh to us from the uh, Festival of Dangerous Ideas, which I understand he got a wonderful reception, which is great. And it's wonderful to see so many people here tonight to equally give a good reception. He's an award-winning peace activist, a Middle East commentator, and a member of the Palestinian Parliament by training, so someone interested in healing all manner of things and now heads a significant uh, medical organisation seeking to make a difference. He's been instrumental in establishing a vibrant civil society in the occupied Palestinian territories and together with Edward Sayyid and others has co-founded Al Mudabra, the Palestinian National Initiative Movement that provides a reformist inclusive, democratic alternative to the two main political groups in Palestine. He does arm himself with peace and understands that without justice there is no true peace. So it's a great privilege to ask him to address us now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming here today. I'm so happy to be here in prison. This is the first time I come to this wonderful town. I've been before to Australia once, uh, 11 years ago, and uh, but I didn't come to this one then. And uh, I think that one of the most encouraging things that I felt and uh, seen is the, how much change has happened here in terms of support to the Palestinian cause and in terms of understanding the Palestinian cause and. Uh, appearance and growth of the boycott, divestment, sanction movement here in Australia. Uh, this all uh, means a lot to me, as much as uh, uh, the words that were just said here about uh, justice, uh, about uh, peace, about the comparison between what the suffering of people here in Australia or in South Africa and the Palestinian people. This means a lot to me. So thank you so much for these kind words and for your care about the uh, Palestinian cause. Today I uh, thought I will uh, try to bring to your attention the reality of the situation on the ground and uh, what we think is the way out of this, what kind of, uh, what, what are the things we can do and we should do, and what are the things you can do and you should do uh, to correct the injustice that we live through. And, uh, it's important to mention that about a month ago, uh, it was the 20th anniversary of the so-called Oslo Agreements, which were supposed to produce peace. And uh, after 20 years of these agreements, I think that's uh, sufficient time to judge whether they were okay or not. And uh, at that time, we opposed them, me, Dr. Haider Abdi Shafi, Edward Said, and that opposition to the flaws of that agreement was the basis of the formation of our new movement, the Palestinian National Initiative. We opposed them then because we thought uh, they were not a real solution. We opposed them because they did not include and guarantee complete and immediate cessation and suspension of all settlement illegal activities. And we opposed them because they marginalized many of the Palestinian people, especially those who are living in the diaspora. And we opposed them because we thought they were interim uh, agreements without identifying the outcome, the end outcome, because they were partial and uh, we've been used to Israeli Zionist behavior of, uh, of, of uh, first uh, uh, dividing issues, then postponing them, then liquidating them. And uh, that has been unfortunate to the courts. So after 20 years, one can easily probably say today that we were right. And uh, all these flaws should not be repeated. And uh, I'm saying that today because uh, at this time, after 20 years of Oslo, the number of illegal settlers, by the way, everybody agrees that they are illegal, including the United States. Uh, the number has grown from 150,000 to 650,000 in the occupied territories. And yet, 
the same mistake was done again. Initiating new negotiations without freezing the settlement activities. Under the pressure from the United States and some other governments, the Palestinian Authority conceded and accepted to start negotiations without stopping settlement activities. And we are seeing again yet another example of uh, systematic uh, mistakes that are happening one time and again. In 1993, when Palestinians accepted the idea of two-state solution, they thought they were concluding a painful compromise, but a compromise that would lead to an end of their suffering and the creation of a Palestinian state. During the last 20 years, and what we what we have seen and what we see today is nothing but constant effort from Israeli side to compromise the compromise. And that is, of course, extremely problematic because if time was not so important 10 years ago, it is today very important because the window of opportunity is completely closing for the two-state solution. And uh, after 20 years of the so-called Oslo Agreement, we've seen repeatedly efforts to make the so-called peace process, which is supposed to be an instrument to achieve peace. We've seen repeatedly the peace process becoming a substitute. And we've seen the longest occupation in modern history, 20, year, 20, 20 46 years of occupation, and 64 years of dispossession of the Palestinian people, we've seen this transformed into a full-fledged, much worse apartheid than the one that prevailed in South Africa at one point in time. In reality, what we see is not through these processes, is not an action towards two-state solution, nor an action towards one-state solution. What we see are processes that are leading to no state solution. And we should be aware of that. But considering all of that, uh, let me show you how during these years, Israel has managed to destroy opportunities for peace, to create repeated cycles of violence, and to separate Jerusalem completely from the West Bank, separate West Bank from Gaza, separate Palestinians inside Palestine from those in the diaspora, and most recently separate 61% of the West Bank from the rest of it uh, through the division, division of the land into area A, B, and C. If we look at the maps, we can see that the whole idea of two-state solution is not a new one. The idea of two-state solution appeared back in 1947 when the UN resolution decided that there should be two states, a Palestinian state in the green area in about 44% uh, of the land, and Israeli state in the white area on 54% of the land. In 1948, Israel was established not on 54% that was assigned to it, but it was established on 78% through war. And by organizing several massacres, half or more than half of the Palestinian people became refugees in other countries. Today, there are about 6 million people, representing probably the largest refugee group in the world. What remained was West Bank and Gaza, which were occupied also by Israel in 1967. And when Palestinians in 88 agreed to give up the dream of one state solution where Palestinians, whether they are Christians or Muslims or seculars, would live side by side with Jewish people in one democratic state with equal rights, because that was originally the historic Palestinian solution, they agreed under international pressure. The PLO agreed to accept two-state solution so Palestinians would have this little tiny mini-state in West Bank and Gaza in less than 22% of the land, which is less than half of what we should have had according to the UN resolution. To the great surprise of the Palestinian leadership, 
when they went to Camp David in 2000, they discovered that the Israeli offer was this map, uh, that the state would have no borders, it would be besieged, surrounded by Israeli army from everywhere, that Jerusalem would be annexed completely to Israel, and that big parts of the land would be annexed also to Israel for settlement's sake. Later, this is the new map that the Israelis are proposing, where they would take the whole Jordan Valley, and the most recent declared decision is Mr. Netanyahu uh, declaration that he will build a wall from the eastern side to complete the wall from the western side, and thus do nothing but uh, dividing the Palestinian territories and consolidating a division of these territories into nothing but clusters of ghettos and pantostats. So we have to look at the maps and see the actual process that is happening. If uh, maybe some politicians in some countries, including maybe some of them in your own government today, think that Palestinians could forget what's happening, or that the world can forget what's happening, but I don't think that is possible. Because when we look at the sequence of these maps, we do realize the process of expansion, uh, land appropriation, and uh, the gradual destruction of the possibility of a compromise and peace based on two-state solution. This, just to give you an idea of how severe the matter is, I would like to show you the map of what exists today in the Palestinian territory. This is the green line of the West Bank. That is the 67 borders between the West Bank and Israel. And this is what they call Area A, where the Palestinian Authority exists. It's, uh, of course, not a full authority because the Israeli army can enter any of these places anytime they want, as they did recently in many cities, arresting people and uh, doing what, whatever they like. But uh, this is that area where the Palestinian Authority exists. When you read the papers, you think that the Palestinian Authority is a true state, you know. Uh, but uh, that is nothing but a, a self-governing uh, little authority that is still under Israeli military occupation. The area B is, uh, are all these little islands where the Palestinians can be responsible for garbage disposal, water issues maybe, or uh, not water issues even, for garbage disposal, health issues, education, but no authority whatsoever. And the biggest problem is what they call area C, which is under full and complete Israeli control where Palestinians cannot have a pipe to water supply, or build a house, or a school, or a kindergarten without an Israeli permission. And that area represents today 61% of the territory of the West Bank. This area is devoted completely, most of it, to the use of Israeli illegal settlements. And that's where, that's the map according to which the Israeli negotiators are negotiating today. Uh, this did not happen, of course, by accident. It happened according to a plan that was put by the Israeli government in 1967. And the only map that looks like this was this map of the South African Pantostan system during the apartheid time. In South Africa then, there were Pantostans run by African, uh, South African people. But, and in some of these Pantostans, there were governments. In one of them, as a matter of fact, there was a king. But that meant nothing. Those were governments and people who are under the complete control and domination of the South African apartheid system. The same situation exists today in Palestine, where the Palestinian Authority is under the full control, practically, of the Israeli side. And uh, Gaza itself is not really free because it is besieged by the Israeli army from the land, from the water, and from air. So practically, the occupation continues. Now, this, as I said, happened according to a plan that was put in place by a person called the Gal Alon, who was the deputy prime minister of Israel in 1967. It was put in place because we disappointed the Israelis. The, since in 67 war, we did not leave. We remained, we stayed resilient. P 
people were ready to die and not leave their homes and not repeat the mistake of 1948. Because of that, we created what we call the demographic factor, which is our presence on the land. And to deal with that, they created this plan to build settlements around Jerusalem, along the Jordan Valley, and then in the north and in the south, so that the demographic presence of Palestinians would be clusters in, clustered in these ghettos or pantostans, and to prevent the possibility of a contiguous Palestinian entity. When I say the word apartheid, many Israelis get angry. But I usually, I, I usually ask them to give me an alternative description of a situation where, on average, a Palestinian is allowed to use no more than 50 cubic meters of water per year, while an Israeli illegal settler, settler is allowed to use 2,400 from our own water in the West Bank. That is 48 times more than a Palestinian would be allowed to use. What would you describe, how would you describe the situation when an Israeli GDP per capita is $32,000, while the Palestinian GDP per capita is only $1,400, and yet we are obliged to buy products at Israeli market price because there is an imposed market and tax and price union? How would you describe the situation when Palestinians having less than uh, less income by 22 times than Israel is, yet we are obliged to pay double the price for water and electricity than what Israel is paying. Or how would you describe the situation when you have road segregation, where major roads, as I will show you later, are exclusive for Jewish or Israeli settlers? or Israeli army, and if a Palestinian is caught driving or walking on these major roads, he would be or she would be sentenced to six months in jail. This segregation of roads did not exist even during the worst time of apartheid or segregation in South Africa or segregation in the United States. More than that, how would you describe the situation when two systems of laws exist in the same land for two people who live on the same land. Uh, an Israeli democratic law for Jewish people and an oppressive military rule for Palestinians and uh, where Israel is using a complex of so many laws the way it likes. That, by the way, includes the Ottoman Turkish law although the Ottoman Turkish Empire disappeared a long time ago. The British mandatory law, although the British mandate has gone a long time ago. The Jordanian law, the Israeli law, and no less than 2,400 military orders. And if that is not sufficient, the Israeli government can issue any new military orders and consider them laws. The separation of Jerusalem was uh, done in a very systematic way, and maybe this slide will show you why it was a mistake to sign the Oslo Agreement without first freezing the settlement activities. The gray area here that you see is the area of East Jerusalem, which was annexed by force by Israel. And uh, you will see here the number of settlements that were created around Jerusalem and uh, in Jerusalem. This is how many settlements existed in 1987.